God, our living Father, we give you thanks for sending our Lord Jesus Christ to give his life as bread for the world. Fill us now with your spirit that we may make the most of the time understanding your will and expressing your wisdom in the midst of the people you have chosen. Amen. As you are able, if you will please stand for the call to worship. The God of wisdom sent Jesus Christ, the bread of life, to teach us his ways, feed us, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. And now we will sing the opening hymn. Jesus, come, for we invite you, number 187, verses 1, 2, and 3.
great and steadfast love for us through Jesus Christ, our bread of life. By his flesh and blood, our sins are forgiven, and we have eternal life. Alleluia. Amen. It's there in the newborn cry, there in the light of every sunrise, there in the shadows of this life, your great grace. It's there. Bye. 
question for you all today. When Aladdin rubs the lamp in his hand, what, what, what comes out? Have you all seen Aladdin? A genie. A genie. What, what, what does a genie give? Gives three wishes. That's right. Three wishes. Wishes are kind of cool because when you wish for something, you, you get the thing that you want more than anything else. So if somebody came up to you right now and said, what do you wish for? What, what would you want? What, what, what's the one thing you want more than anything else? You could have anything. What, what would it be? Toys, Toys okay. Presents. Presents. Stuffed animals. Well, those are all really good and great things. There was actually a guy in the Bible, though, named Solomon. He was actually King David's son. And when King Solomon became king, hi Rosie, sit down. When King Solomon became king, God came to him in a dream and said, what do you want? If there's anything you want, I will give you. What's the one thing you want? What do you think King Solomon asked for? What do you think the one thing he wanted more than anything else was? Things? Stuff? Toys? Stuffed animals? Movies? Things like that? He actually asked for... What's that? Jewelry. Actually, he got lots and lots of jewelry, but that's another story. <laughs> he actually asked for wisdom. He wanted the ability to know what, what the right thing to do and what the wrong thing was so that he could always choose to do the right thing because he always wanted to do whatever was going to please God. And he knew the only way that he could possibly do that was if God gave him wisdom. And you know what happened when he asked God for that? You think he got it? Nope. No. He did. He did, yes. God gave him the wisdom that he asked for, which is why King Solomon is actually known as one of the wisest people who've ever lived. And it just reminds us that we can always ask God for what we want. And if it's something that we can use to make God happy or for God's glory, God will give it to us. So before you guys go down the aisle and see Miss Katie, let us pray. Will you pray after me? Dear God, thank you for listening to the things that we most want. Help us to ask for the things we need to make you happy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you guys next week. But before we read together God's word, let us first pray for God's wisdom. Great God of steadfast love, we study your works and delight in your ways. Illumine our understanding by your Holy Spirit, that we may reverence your name, grow in your wisdom, and discern between good and evil. Amen. And now together, let us turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. And you, the congregation, begin in verse 15. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never hurts to read an extra verse. Our second reading from Israel's history is from the book of 1 Kings, beginning in chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. That can be found on page 281 of your pew Bible. Listen again for God's word. 
Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. At the time, and the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. And now moving to chapter 3 and continuing in verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. This is the word of God. It can be cute when we ask kids open-ended questions like, what do you want, isn't it? So how would you answer that question? What do you want? Anything in the world, what do you want? If God wrote you a blank check, how would you fill it out? What would you ask for? Now for me, there's a few things I might ask for. I love Tag Heuer watches. I think they're awesome. I would love someday to own a Tag Heuer watch. I would give so much to be present if the Steelers or the Pirates or the Penguins won their respective championship, to physically be present when they did that. That'd be great. And since I was 13, I've had this dream that I will someday purchase and restore a 1965 Ford Mustang. And lastly, I've had a lifelong dream that I would just love someday to hike the entire Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. Now, our greatest wishes say an awful lot about us and our priorities in life as well. And when I think about the list that I just named, honestly, it's pretty materialistic. There's not really a whole lot of God going on in any of those things, with the exception of maybe spending a few months in God's creation. Is it much the same with you? Are your things honoring God? Are they the th sorts of things you'd want other people to know and think about you? Our reading today takes place in a time of transition, much like we're now in. Summer is starting to wind down. School is actually about to resume in a few days. Parents love that. And Sunday school and choir will be back here in church shortly. Before we know it, the weather is going to start to cool off and then get really cold. Leaves will fall off the trees. Advent will be here before we know it. Transitions can be energizing, exciting. They can also be a time that causes a great deal of anxiety, though, because we ask, well, what if, what if things won't be the same? And oftentimes in transition, they won't be the same. What if I don't like the way it's going to be? Transitions, because they can be so stressful, can also be a time of great temptation, a temptation to cut corners or to find the easy way through life. Now, David dies in the first few verses of our reading, and Solomon, his son with Bathsheba, assumes the throne. And if we read the parts before and the in-between parts, we would actually see how Solomon came 
to have that throne firmly established. It was actually a pretty ruthless purge of all his enemies. But the bulk of our reading isn't about how Solomon consolidated his power, but about the early days of Solomon's reign. Solomon is known, among other things, for his wealth, for building the very first temple in Jerusalem, the one that would be destroyed by, by the Babylonians in 586, the one that would be rebuilt by Herod, Herod the Great, or would be rebuilt, rather, uh, by the exiles returning from Babylon and expanded by Herod the Great. Solomon is also known for his incredible wisdom, and our reading reveals how that came to be. Yet for all the brightness, hope, and expectation, there are signs, even at the beginning of Solomon's kingship, that he is a flawed person, much like his father David, because Solomon is known also, among other things, for having over 700 wives, most of those from foreign lands that brought with them their foreign gods and worship that would eventually lead him astray. Solomon and his actions also seem to have his priorities in the wrong order. For Solomon, it was all about taking care of his needs first, and then God, and then giving to the people he ruled whatever was left over, when the proper order, at least for a king, should be that the king would come after God and the people. It also begins to note in our reading that Solomon is worshiping at the high place in Gibeon. The high places actually predate the Israelites even being in the Holy Land. They hearken back to the pagan worship practices of the Canaanites who originally lived there. They were always a constant source of temptation to follow other gods than the God of Israel. Yet even in spite of this, God comes to Solomon at this place and at this time and asks or reveals to Solomon, rather, that God is with him just as God was with his father David. And then God asks that question, what do you want? What is it more than anything else I could give you? The way Solomon answers and responds, I think, gives us four takeaways from this reading. The first is thanks and gratitude. Now, how many of us, when we thought a few moments ago about what that greatest thing we wanted that we actually began by thanking God for all the things God's already done. Probably none of us. It's not common for people to think about thanking God first. But that is where Solomon begins. He begins by recounting all the things that God has already done, that great covenant God made with David. And he speaks of it in such a way, of this great relationship that existed between God and his father David, in terms of the covenant, and, and speaks in a way almost that Solomon seems to be saying, I want a part of this as well. Please continue this relationship with me just as you did with my father. He notes well the basis of the relationship between God and David was based on the Hebrew term hesed. Now, hesed is often translated as loving kindness, but it also means loyalty, faithfulness, devotion, unconditional love. It's often parallel for the Greek term agape, which we think of as the sacrificial, unconditional love of God. Now Solomon, young as he is, probably 20 years old or so at this time, he notes that everything David had, he had because of the relationship he had with God, and the relationship he had with God was expressed by God through this idea of hesed. So another question we ought to ask ourselves, more than what is that one thing we want? We should ask ourselves, how do we thank God? Or do we even thank God at all? A second takeaway is the act of asking. And this is, in fact, the prime action of our reading, that Solomon takes initiative and asks God for what he wants. Now, it's true, God first said to him, tell me what you want. So Solomon was just following orders, but Solomon still had to say, this is what I want. This is what I would like. So how does Solomon fill out that blank check? How does, what is it that he asks for? He asks for wisdom. Wisdom is the one thing more than anything else he wants. Wisdom is not to be confused with information. Wisdom is not knowing all of the right answers for the big test. Wisdom is knowing how to get and use the information in a way that brings glory to God, in a way that benefits others, ways that can even benefit ourselves. A political pundit, Ariana Huffington, recently wrote several years ago that we are a generation bloated with information and starved for wisdom. And that's very true. 
there's never been a time where more information was more readily available than it is now. We can know just about anything about just about anything, yet we can't even figure out what to watch on TV. We can't figure out what food to buy and prepare to share a meal with our families. We can't even think of a good gift to buy our loved one. The proper use of information has never seemed more farther away than it is now. So Solomon asks for the gift of wisdom. He wants to know what is the right and what is the wrong so that he can always choose the right path in life. He does this with the Hebrew term mishpat, this idea of judging or deciding or discerning between what is good and what is evil. It's really not a bad trait for a king to have, to know what the right thing and the wrong thing is to do. But it really also, this term really does convey this sense of wisdom, not just information. So, so another question we could ask of ourselves is, what are we asking of God? What are we willing to ask for? Do we ask for the things that we want, watches and sporting events, or do we ask for things that are needed? Do we ask for things that will help us engage in ministry and mission, or do we ask for things for personal gain and benefit? And it's really right here that temptation rears its ugly head, because this is where we ask for the easy way out, for the simple things, the good things, the extra things in life, not the things that really matter, though. A third takeaway from this reading is the idea of reception, this idea of receiving onto ourselves what is asked for. Now, we can thank God all we want. We can ask God for all we want. But in the end, we also must make the choice of receiving what God chooses to give us, just as we would receive a gift given by someone else. God will not force anything upon us, even if we ask for it. In the closing chapters of John's gospel, when Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection, he says a very curious thing to them and then breathes on them. He says to them, receive the Holy Spirit, and then breathes on them. He says, receive it. Don't take it. Don't steal it. Don't grasp it because you can't do all of those things. Don't worry. It's not going to be forced upon you. All you can do is receive it because it is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift of God. And in that blank check metaphor, this act of receiving is the act of taking that check and filling it out with what we want. Yet when we ask of such a gift, any gift from God, and we actually take that ability to receive it, there comes some responsibility with that. Solomon notes that God's people were chosen by God for himself. Now, election is the theological concept that we are God's people, that God has chosen us to be part of God's people. And that not only conveys a special status upon us, it conveys a certain responsibility as well, because gifts from God carry great power to do incredible and amazing things in the world. And as the philosophy of Spider-Man can tell us, with great power comes great responsibility. Same is true in the Bible. So do we dare assume that responsibility? Are we willing to accept the responsibility and the accountability for using God's gifts in the ways that God intends? Because after all, this is the heart of stewardship. Stewardship simply is, what do we do with the things that God has given to us? Do we use them for us, and then for God, and then for others? That's the way Solomon seemed to live his life. Or do we take the rear seat? Do we do for God and others first, and then see the great things that God does after that? These are all questions we should be asking regularly. Now, the final takeaway we have is the idea of using. Using is the rubber of the gift meeting the road of responsibility. With any gift of God, we are to make good use and wise use of it. That's the practical living out of stewardship, what it means to be a good and faithful steward. For Solomon, the wisdom that he asked for and then received was to do the job of ruling and leading the people of God. Now, in life, it is common to ask God for strength, for the ability to do certain things. But sometimes what we really want is, God, will you just take care of this for me? I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this. You, you, you take it for me. When my youngest daughter, Tara, was about three or four years old, she was in a Sunday school room 
where her Sunday school teacher asked her, so what does God or what, what does Jesus do for you? So the kids were saying things. And then the Sunday school teacher says, well, what would you like God to do for you? Well, I want God to make my bed. <laughs> we should never ask God to do things for us that God can do through us. We are given and blessed by gifts so that we can be a blessing to other people. The great people in the history of our faith, they did the great things, the faithful things, gave God all the glory in these things because God gave them the power to do so with these gifts, not by sitting idly by and saying, God, you take care of it. Martin Luther King Jr. accomplished so much in his shortened life because of what God did through him. Could God have used other people to do that same work? Yes. Has God used other people besides him to do that same work? Yes. But Martin Luther King did not pray and then walk away. No, he prayed and then walked into the storm. He prayed and went and faced the challenge of that work. He prayed and went and faced the whirlwind that was to come against him. Just after our reading ends, we see how Solomon makes use of this gift of wisdom. And we see why Solomon was credited as being one of the wisest people ever. It's why we have the proverb of the wisdom of Solomon. Because Solomon uses this newly bestowed gift when two women come before him, both claiming to be the mother of the same child. A little bit later, the Queen of Sheba, a woman of great power and influence, comes because she has heard of Solomon's great wisdom and she wants his advice and his counsel. Yet for all of this, Solomon and his life and the life we can read in the pages of Scripture also show us what happens when we choose not to use God's gifts, when we ignore them or set them aside. Because in his later life, with all of those wives, with his increasing wealth, with his increasingly idolatrous worship, the conflicts he had with his children and the other leaders in Israel, it seems this gift of wisdom that he was given that held so much promise for him and for the people of God it seems like he set it aside, that he forgot all about it, that he didn't remember that God gave it to him. It reminds us to use what we are given all of the time, that there is no time off, no days off, that we are to use it all of the time. So it's in this way that we end much in the same place as where we began. We begin and we end with gratitude, with a grateful heart. Solomon wants a heart that listens. It actually says, I want a willing or an understanding mind but in Hebrew the actual term means a listening heart I want my thoughts my motivations my understanding my conceptions of everything my ability to discern between what is right and wrong I want to see I want to hear I want to perceive things the same way you do God that is what I want that is what Solomon asks for that is the wisdom that he seeks he asks for this heart, and God gives him this heart, says you will have that listening heart. And because you asked for this good thing, I'm going to give you the things you didn't even ask for. So a final question we can ask of ourselves is if we are beginning and ending all that we do with a healthy dose of gratitude, do we give God all of the thanks for the things we have? If we do, we're likely, like Solomon, at least in this reading, to get things right. That when we're handed that blank check, that we fill it out in a way that honors and pleases God. That we do things in order to serve God, to serve others, rather than serve ourselves first. To ask for these things that we are given. And to use them, not only to the best of our ability, but to the best way we can honor God. Because in grace and love and mercy, God, through Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, does give us that blank check. It says, what shall I give you? What, what do you want? What can I give you each day? But we are told that we must ask wisely. We must choose wisely. We must accept the responsibility that comes from such a gift. And that we must use all of it for the glory of God, for it's God who gives. And thanks be to God for all that we have, all that we are being given now, all that we will be given in the days to come. Thanks be to you alone, our Lord and our God. Amen. And let us pray to God who has redeemed us, we who are God's people. 
Faithful God, you are ever mindful of your covenant and invite us to ask gifts of your goodness. In your steadfast love, receive our requests for the well-being of your church, your world, and your people. Grant your church understanding and discernment to faithfully carry out your mission in the world. Cause us to walk in wisdom concerning your creation, mindfully stewarding its provision for all, of, all living creatures. Give those who govern wise and discerning minds that your way of justice and compassion would prevail among the nations. Provide food for the hungry, hope for the despairing, and wisdom for the wandering. Help us to make the most of the time, walking in your ways, filled with your spirit, living out your will. In your steadfast love, let your wisdom uphold those people and those situations that we remember now and lift to you in our hearts. Holy and awesome God, you are the answer to our prayers. We give to you all of the people and situations we have named aloud and in silence. And hear now the conclusion of our prayer as we pray in the way that Christ taught us. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Be filled with the Spirit and make the most of time. Walk in wisdom and grow in understanding of God's will, feeding on the gift of Jesus Christ, our living bread. And the God of steadfast love feeds you with the body and blood of Jesus Christ fills you with the Spirit, and guides you with wisdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.